like to be there in the Holy Land, in the land of Israel, and to have sat down before him with the multitudes, or to have been one of the twelve, and to hear his words, to see him with the literal eye, to be able to touch him, to uh, just be there with him. I know I have tried to imagine this a number of times, what he was like as he walked the earth. And of course, as you notice, the title of my message this morning is Jesus. What was he like? What kind of a person was he as people interacted with him during his earthly ministry? How was it that he was so able to not only attract, but influence countless multitudes, even during his earthly ministry? And we all know what an influence and impact his life has had upon the whole world ever since that time. In fact, we even date our calendars from the time of his birth. As we seek to understand his personality and his character, we have certain, not only hints in the New Testament, but we also have clear statements that tell us what type of a person this really was. Sometimes you have seen pictures of Jesus. Artists have tried to imagine what he looked like. Some of those pictures portray a rather frail, a rather uh, distant or ephemeral type of person. They don't seem to portray a very rugged, a very uh, strong person. And yet, as you think about what Jesus did, you have to recognize that those portraits of him or those pictures may not be very accurate. For example, this terrain of Israel is in many places very rugged. And yet Jesus traveled constantly over hill and dale, going here and there uh, by foot, probably for the most part, speaking to great multitudes without the benefit of these, having to speak very loudly perhaps at times so that all could hear, which suggests powerful lungs and good voice. Here is a, a hint that I get that Jesus was certainly not a weakling in any physical way at all. Added to that is what the scriptures tell us in Mark, the sixth chapter, and the third verse. <clears throat> It'd be easy to pass over this verse and not give it the attention that it deserves. But we read that Jesus went to his hometown, which was Nazareth, as you know, and he began teaching in the synagogue. Many who heard him were amazed, we are told. And they asked the question in verse 2, where did this man get these things? What's this wisdom that has been given him that even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. These were Jesus' neighbors. They knew him. They'd seen him grow up in their midst. The family was still living there, apparently Mary and the children. Apparently Joseph was dead by this time. And they call him the carpenter. The carpenter. Which apparently indicates that after Joseph died, Jesus, as the eldest son, carried on the carpentry shop that had been he had grown up in, learned the trade, apparently, from Joseph. 
And now Jesus is the carpenter. Remember that carpenters in those days did not have power tools. Everything was done by hand, the sawing and all the rest, everything. And therefore, it suggests a person of strength, of physical presence, muscular ability. We do not have this effeminate Jesus that is sometimes pictured by the artist, but we have a real, really strong person who had been used to hard work, physical work, from childhood. Because it was the Jewish custom that every boy should be taught a trade. And the trade that Jesus was taught was that of carpentry. And he learned it, no doubt, at Joseph's knee as a little child. And he learned it as he grew up during those adolescent years and in young manhood. All of that is suggested by this little verse, isn't this the carpenter? And so I suggest to you that Jesus, even physically, was a strong presence. He was a strong person, a physically powerful man. We do not need to think of him in this other fashion that has been so often pictured by the artists. But we have a lot more that's told to us in the scriptures. For example, in Matthew, the seventh chapter, as Jesus concludes the famous Sermon on the Mount early in his ministry, <clears throat> we read in Matthew 7, <clears throat> at the end of the chapter, verse 28, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Here's a man who could stand up there, who could face a vast multitude of people, who could tell it as it was, as we say, tell it like it is, and at the conclusion of his speaking, the people would have to conclude, this man truly speaks with authority. He knows whereof he speaks. He is convincing. He has strength. He has convincing power and persuasive power. Even Jesus' enemies were forced to acknowledge this when police were sent to arrest him by the temple authorities, we read in verse 45 that finally the temple guards, this is John 7, went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? They had sent them to arrest Jesus. When they came back empty-handed, they were asked, well, why didn't you bring him in? We sent you out to do that. The reply was, verse 46, no one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards reply, or the guards declared. Nobody ever talked like this before. They couldn't even arrest him at this particular time. They just didn't feel they could go right in there and barge in and take him. They were just too impressed with what he had to say and the way he said it. This was the kind of a personality that he was. But even more than that, there is a description that we find over and over in the scriptures that to me really reaches the heart of what Jesus was like. In the 11th chapter of John, in the 31st verse, we have the account of the Lord coming to that sad home of Mary and Martha after their brother Lazarus had died. We read in verse 31 that the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, 
she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who, have, who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Here's a strong man, powerful man, but a man who can cry, who can weep tears, a man who can be deeply moved at the sorrow of others who feels for them in that sorrow, who also has that sorrow himself. The writer of Hebrews says, we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all point tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Our high priest is not some unfeeling kind of being, distant, unapproachable, but one who can feel as we feel, one who can know as we know, and who can sorrow as we sorrow, even to the shedding of tears and groaning with sorrow. In Matthew, the 20th chapter, we have the word that I think suggests all of this. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 29. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately, they received their sight and followed him. I'd like to call your attention to that word compassion. We read that word many times in the New Testament in connection with Jesus' earthly ministry. The word compassion is a very interesting word. It means literally to suffer with. To suffer with. It doesn't simply mean that you pity somebody but it means that you feel that suffering that they are feeling. You, you share it. You're involved with that feeling. You know what it's like, and you feel it along with them. Jesus could feel what it was like. Even though he was not blind, he could feel their hunger to be able to see to be able to be like normal people and see as others do and not be in perpetual darkness as they were. And so in his compassion, it says that he touched their eyes and they could see. But it wasn't simply one or two individuals with which Jesus had this compassion. As we look at the chapter 14 of Matthew in verses 13 and 14, we notice that, that uh, Jesus withdrew to a place where he could be alone. When he heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowd followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Here are people that come out to where he is. They're seeking him. They travel out there on foot, maybe a long ways. 
We're so used to our cars and other vehicles today that we forget what it was like when people traveled long distances by foot to get there, miles and miles. I remember when I first went to Minnesota as a minister there back in the early 50s, that some of the old time members there that were up in their 80s and 90s were still talking about the early ministers there back in the 1800s, and they still remembered them, who walked many, many miles to preach. They didn't, some of them, have even a horse. And they would walk maybe 20 miles to go and preach and then walk home at the end of the service. And a lot of the people in those days had to do that. <clears throat> Here these people came out to be with Jesus. And it says he had compassion on them. He cared for them. He wanted to help them. He loved them. And as we look also in the ninth chapter of Matthew, verses 36 through 38, <clears throat> we read, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, <clears throat> like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. The Lord, again, is pictured as one with compassion for the people, not only for their physical needs, but for their emotional and mental needs as well, because it mentions them as being harassed, helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. No one to care for them spiritually, to worry about what they, their spiritual welfare was like, to be concerned whether or not they were progressing in their growth toward God and his ways. Christ cared. He cared deeply about their welfare, both spiritual and physical welfare. It seems to me that this word compassion, perhaps more than any other one word, sums up the character that we have in Christ. We have also the examples of his forgiveness toward those who had sinned. We have, for example, the one mentioned in Luke 7. Very beautiful picture here, beginning in verse 36 of Luke 7. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of a woman she is, that she is a sinner. This woman had a bad reputation in that town. The Pharisee knew very well who she was. She was one of the ill repute women of the town. And so he says of Jesus, I wonder if this man can really be a prophet. Why would he allow this kind of woman, of all people, to touch him even? Then Jesus said to Simon, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii, and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. 
you did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. This woman, though she had a bad reputation, was a woman who wanted to change her life. She's a woman who recognized in Jesus the purity and holiness and love and compassion that perhaps she had been seeking all along. And some who had been driven into the kind of life that she had been in had never known that kind of love had never known that kind of compassion, that kind of concern, that kind of care, and she saw it in him. The woman taken in adultery, remember, was brought to Jesus. And the Pharisees said, this woman was caught in the very act. Shall we stone her? Of course, the law said stone her. Jesus didn't say anything for a little while. He just stooped down and wrote on the ground. <clears throat> and this is story, of course, is given us in John 8. But at the end, finally, he looked up and said, whoever is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And they, being ashamed, <laughs> one by one, filed out. And finally, Jesus and the woman were standing there alone. And Jesus said to her, has nobody condemned you? She said, no man, Lord. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Here we have, again, that compassion, that caring that was part, so much a part of his very being. And as he was on that cross for you and me, dying, pouring out his life's blood for us, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgive them. We might say, well, all of that was long ago, 2,000 years ago almost. But remember what the book of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 13.8, very short verse. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He has not changed. He is the same now as he was then. He's not mortal anymore, that's true. He has endless life. He has been raised after the power of an endless life, the writer of Hebrews tells us. Neither can he be tempted anymore as he was in his mortal life. But apart from that, his personality is the same. His love, his compassion, his forgiveness, his caring, none of that has changed. He is the same person. And he loves us with a perfect love. He is compassionate on us in our weakness with a boundless compassion. He cares. When we suffer, he feels that too. We need to realize that. We need to recognize that. And we must also recognize not only that that is the way he is, but Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father, for I and my Father are one. Jesus is the perfect picture we are told that he is the express image of his Father. The way Jesus is in his character, that's the way God is. That's the way the Father is. And in looking at the life of our Lord as he walked the earth and seeing how he dealt with human be other human beings, with individuals, with families, that should tell us something about how God wants to deal with us. 
Our problem is that we are not willing so many times, even those of us who believe. At times, we want to go and do as Adam and Eve did. We want to hide. We hide ourselves. We're afraid. Rather than coming right out to the Lord and seeking him in all of our weakness and helplessness and sinfulness, we sometimes simply hide away from him rather than seeking the compassion and the care and the forgiveness that we need so desperately. I remember reading one time about a Japanese statesman who said to an American, and I'd like, I, I think this is very telling, he said, we do not worship our emperor, we love him utterly. And then he gave a little piece of Japanese history. The commander before Port Arthur one day called for volunteers. This was the time when Japan in its early days in the 1800s, before they became a world power, were being uh, attacked by Western powers to open up Japan. He called for volunteers to cut the barbed wire entanglements. You will never come back, the commander said, nor can you carry a gun. You will take your place and cut one or two wires and fall dead. Another will take your place and cut one or two wires more. But you will know that upon your dead bodies, the armors of your emperor will march to victory. Whole regiments volunteered for these sure death raids. And then this is what he concluded. He said, if you Christians loved your God as we love our emperor, you would long since have taken the world for him. I think he had something there. If we showed the compassion and the love and the caring, and the concern that our God and his son have shown towards others, we would long since have won great multitudes more than we have won for the Lord. The early pagans during the first century said, how these Christians love one another. That was one of the things that really attracted them to the Lord and to the gospel. Do they see that today in us, those who are living about us, the ones with whom we rub shoulders every day. We work with them. They're our neighbors. They go to school with us, whatever it may be. Do they see that kind of caring in us? Not only for our fellow believers, but for all. For the scripture teaches us to do good unto all men, especially to those who are of the household of faith, but to all whether or not they happen to share our faith yet, we owe them a debt of love and compassion because God has shown us his love and his compassion through Jesus, his son. Amen. Our Father, we praise you and your son Jesus for the wonderful salvation that you have wrought and we praise you for such a son as Jesus with the love and compassion and caring that he has that reflects your own. And Father, we do pray now that you'll go with us as we depart from this service, that you will guide us, fill us with your spirit. May we be filled with that love and caring that characterizes your people. And we pray, Father, that others seeing that in us will wish to follow your son also. Go with us now, and we fi our hearts are filled with praise toward you and toward your son. In his name we pray, amen.